Hello everyone, so you may or may not have seen a recent blog post on YoYo Games' website about GML, Game Maker Language Updates, coming to Game Maker in, I think, Q4, late 2019. Uh, people are quite excited. Uh, they've been asking for a lot of this stuff for quite a while. But a lot of users, um, including myself to quite some degree, only learn to code using Game Maker, so we don't necessarily know all the best practices, uh, things, techniques, and stuff that we've been missing from other programming languages. It's something I talk about a lot. It's we don't know what we don't know. Uh, I know some of this stuff, but even the things I know, I only understand from the context of other programmers who've told me about it, and you know, I don't know a lot about it myself. And sadly, the blog post is also kind of written in uh, what I like to call Russell Ease, uh, and it's <laughs> sadly <laughs> kind of only written for people who do know. There's a lot of assumptions, a few words thrown in there that like it just assumes you understand. And a lot of you might be reading this not knowing what all the cool benefits are that you can get from this stuff. So I wanted to create something quick to just kind of go over a few of these things and explain why or if at all they are exciting. So what I've done is I've kidnapped Lazy Eye from the uh, Reddit slash Game Maker community, who is probably a bit more prepared to give some context to some of this stuff because it is quite exciting. Lazy Eye, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi. So, um... I am a professional programmer that works in Game Maker. I'm working on the game Forager. Um, I'm one of the admins for the Game Maker Discord, uh, and I'm also one of the hosts of Object Podcast, which is a Game Maker podcast. Uh, my entire context and, and work in programming has been in Game Maker. I started in Game Maker, um, but I also love programming and have used other languages um, and, and other engines like Unity. So I have a bit of context, and I've used this kind of stuff in the past. Um, so I'm really excited to explain why this stuff is so exciting, uh, because as I'm going through Twitter and looking at all the reactions of this blog post, um, mm. a lot of people are posting, I can tell this is super exciting, but I don't know why, and I don't know why yeah. this stuff is special. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I'm, it really is special. So I'm excited to go over what that stuff is. So the first thing to understand about chained accessors is that they're not introducing any new functionality any new changes like nothing about this is new it's just um synthetic sugar synthetic sugar mm -hmm. don't know exactly what it's called but it's just something that's nice for us as programmers to have to make our code more organized um so basically you're familiar with json data json uh say that we have a ds map uh that is called player data and inside of that ds map we have another ds map that's called sprites and inside of that ds map we have a list called accessories so that's like our list of accessory sprites. So that's three layers deep. So normally in GML, uh, what you would have to do is you would say var uh, sprites equals player data, and then you would access the key uh, sprites. And then with that variable you just created sprites, you would have to then get your accessories out of it. So you'd say var accessories equals uh, sprites, and then you would access the key accessories. So that takes two lines. Um, is that a huge deal? No, not really. But uh, when you get really, really deep data, like we're talking maybe 10 layers deep of data, this can become really annoying to constantly have to declare all these little local variables in between to get to the data you actually mm -hmm. want when you're not actually, you don't need any of those things. So all a chain to accessor does is it lets us just go in directly instead. I can now say that var accessories equals player data and then I access the key sprites, and then just immediately after that bracket type, accessories. It's just another way to work with arrays and data, essentially. Exactly. It just makes it shorter and easier to write that really just helps code become more organized. So that's super exciting. That's a really nice quality of life thing. It doesn't introduce any broad scope, huge new things you can do in Game Maker, but it's nice. Um, so this is probably, arguably, um, the most exciting thing, although I'll contradict myself on that point as we continue to go along. Um, and people specifically see method variables and they don't understand why it's so special. The number one thing that I saw on Twitter was people saying, how is this any different from a script? Which is a great yeah, question yeah. because in the simplest, most basic way, it's not different from a script, but it really is. <laughs> so normally in Game Maker, say that I wanted to create a script or a collection of code that I can use again and again to add two numbers together. So mm -hmm. what you would normally do is you would go to your resource tree, right click, create new script, name it add, and then you would say return argument zero plus argument one. And that's your adding script. Um, that's fine, that gets the job done. Uh, but 
with these new updates, the game maker, we're starting to tread into uh, OOP concepts or object oriented programming mm-hmm. concepts, uh, which really centralize around the idea of or- organizing our code. Um, they, they give you these questions as to what should be allowed to access this this information? What what should know about this information? Um, the example that I gave earlier in the Discord was, you know, my rock object should never have the ability to run or see uh, my finite state machine code. Or my, sure. my player's health bar shouldn't be able to uh, attack something, you know? And in GameMaker, everything is referenceable everywhere. And specifically, scripts are global. They're kind of like global variables. Anything can call a script. Anything can recognize a script. They're global. So, and this is fine. This makes life really easy because we don't have to worry about where these things go. And I should make it clear, this isn't exactly changing in GameMaker. Uh, we're not getting actual object-oriented programming. It's just becoming more and more fake object-oriented programming. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, to get, so to give some context to this, um, instead of having to have a billion scripts for every single thing you do, and in a huge project, like, you can get way too many scripts. Yeah. In Forager right now, I think we have 1,500 scripts. And wow. it's just, it's so much. And and the thing that's frustrating is that a lot of those scripts, like they don't need to be like global scripts. They're, they're specific to very small things. It's just for organizing our code. So instead now we can type our scripts in line in the code. And part of the reason this is so exciting is just because we can have less of the script files and we can organize our things all in one place. Like if my player has specific uh, scripts that he would use like movement, you know, like you're getting your input and moving scripts. Those are generally only used in the player. You can actually define those in the player's create event and then in the player, just call them as if they're normal scripts. And then in someone else's object, they won't be able to call them because they don't own them. Uh, so that's really helpful. So the basic notation is, so we know argument zero plus argument one, we return that. That's how we add something with a script. With a function, we could say um, add method equals uh, function. Uh, parentheses a comma b and then we open the brackets and we can say return a plus b there's a couple things to note here Uh, for one like i mentioned before we're defining this in an actual script which is nice it reduces clutter Uh, but one really nice thing as well is you'll notice that i named my arguments a and b in the function declaration and then i just used a and b in there Uh, one of the annoying things about game maker that i've i'm personally i've gotten very tired of is having to always you know, at the top of every script, uh, declare local variables that are just grabbing from your arguments. Um, when you name an argument in a function declaration in languages like JavaScript, C Sharp, or anything else, they're like predefined as local variables for you. So if when I say A and B in that function, I already have arguments as the variables A and B. So that's another nice thing. We don't have to declare those. That kind of, that covers how they work in terms of their like broader scope and usage. Um, it's really up to you. You can do so much with them. Uh, the exciting thing that we're going to be able to do once we get to another point in this is called namespacing them, which is just us further organizing where these things go. Um, but it's just nice to reduce the amount of scripts that you have to just scope things to specific things. Like only the player will have this. Um, yeah, I, I think that about covers. Okay, so I suppose what you could say in the most basic sense of what this is adding is that it's a way to do what scripts already do in a way that's neatly tidied away. Um, and yes. And it, it's another new way of structuring and organizing code, which is important because one of Game Maker's, I think, uh, more insidious weaknesses that doesn't really come out until you're really committed into a long-term project is how difficult yeah. a big project can become uh, to, to scale when 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 things get really big, how difficult it become, can become to manage um, mm-hmm. your your code base and stuff going on there. So it seems like those are yes. the kind of problems that quite a few of these changes actually are looking to uh, improve upon, and are what the the community uh, and and that's why people have wanted these changes for so long. Is that is that accurate to say? Yes, actually, exactly. This is adding a lot of longevity, I'd say, to one's usage in Game Maker. Um, that's something I can talk about at the end in terms of like where people lie on a spectrum and what engine they use. Um, but basically, like that that line that you reach where Game Maker is just starting to become really counterproductive in terms of what it can offer you at a mm. scale of a project. That line just got pushed way back. You can use Game Maker for bigger projects now and have way less headaches. Um, 
like knowing what my code and forager looks like now yeah i i wish i wish that it was feasible for me to rewrite the entire game with all this new stuff right now because just the kind of system architecture that a programmer can do now is is mind-blowing but really at the end of the day yes um this is adding similar to what scripts already do but it's letting us do them more organized and just like chained accessors this just having this kind of functionality encourages better programming practices uh like subconsciously like you know in a way in game maker you're currently almost discouraged from doing big massive data structures simply just because like you know that you're gonna have to go through each little layer with its own variable it just doesn't feel mm. like it's built for it but now with chained accessors and with methods you're encouraged to do these good programming concepts which is use good data structures that are really organized and you know super well built and that can go deep use lots of scripts and reusable methods and all this stuff it just now presents it in a way where it makes more sense to do these things it's it's not contradicting itself anymore awesome. uh, which is really great so the next item on the list is multiple scripts in a single source file this is pretty much um exactly what we just talked about it's just defining how this is going to work really um so if i was in a script file um, and then I put multiple methods, so these like function declarations. There's a lot of, okay, I just gotta say, there's a lot of word overlap here. Uh, functions, methods, scripts. Mm, scripts yeah. are always gonna be game maker scripts, but between like functions and methods, uh, the blog post here is referring to them as methods, which is totally fair. Um, and then, but you declare them as functions, and then when they're global, it doesn't change. Sure. If I say function or method, I'm talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, what the blog post is saying here is that in a script file, uh, if you declare a function and you don't put it in like a variable, for example, if you just say like function add, this globally creates this method to be available everywhere. So it would right. literally just be the same as creating a script. Yeah. Anything can access this. Anything can read this. It just lets us do it all in one place. So like maybe, you know, uh, you just have a script called finite state machine mm -hmm. and then you put all your finite state machines methods in there. That's just a nice way to organize things, uh, which is cool. I guess, but the next item on the list shows how we can do it so much more better. This is probably, I think, the most, I'd say, agreed upon feature that people have requested because every single thing that we got today is really exciting and something that people have wanted. But I think lightweight objects is the thing that Game Maker users have agreed is like it makes the most sense for Game Maker to have. Right. Before uh, because... we actually get into it, though, um, because like yes. I think when people uh, and when I first heard about this, I'm expecting yes. um, some new type of resource almost to show up in the resource yes, tree. Yes, yeah. And that's I was, not what I was, this is, right? So. <laughs> I was just about to say, Yo-Yo, mm -hmm. if you're listening, rename Game Maker objects to actors. Because if you don't, people are going yeah. to be so confused. Before we talk about anything with this, we need to clarify some terms. Uh, so first of all, an object in Game Maker is what we create our like classes out of, right? Our players, our enemies, and those things. Um, this word "object" is not what "object" is used for things in every other programming language. Like, for example, in JavaScript, which is where GML is pulling stuff from now, uh, an object is what we know as a DS map, like JSON data. JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. And with the introduction of lightweight objects, what I'm gathering is, is that they're they're part of the underlying system that's being created with functions and the new operator, which we'll get to soon. But they're still offering it to us because it's pretty much just a better DS map. And I would not be surprised if they're kind of grooming lightweight objects to replace DS maps. We'll probably see functions for converting it in and out of JSON uh, because it behaves the same way where it has a a name for a property and then a value to a property. Uh, so the way that it wants you to write it is say like var my object equals and then in brackets um, you have the name of your property which unlike in a DS map which is a string we're just typing it out. So we're going to say uh, my var colon uh, like in JSON data, and then we put the value, so let's say two. And and that's the basic notation of writing an object. And then you can also uh, put functions in there. Uh, like I could say add colon function uh, a, b, and then return a plus b. 
Uh, so you can add anything into an object. This is just like a DS map, and that might be confusing uh, now, now that we have the two of them. And I'm interested to see as to how Game Maker wants to handle that. If we'll still have DS maps, if they will have a, a notable difference between objects, if there's ever a reason to use them over objects. Um, I don't know yet. They mention in the blog that here, let me read this. It says, lightweight objects can be passed around like any other variable in GML and can be used as a data structure with methods and essentially act like a class in its own right. This is confusing. This is misleading because the things that they actually have acting as classes, which I'll explain in a minute, is functions. So lightweight objects are cool, but if we wanted to actually do what people think a lightweight object is, which is they think it's an instance that is more optimized and less heavy... That's what we can actually use functions for. And those are probably using uh, lightweight objects under the hood, but that's not really what we need to worry about right now. Let's put this in an actual context, okay? So if you're lost, you should be able to understand this. Particles in GameMaker, right? We have a particle system that's built into the engine, which is great. It's very fast. You can create pretty effects with it. Um, but there are certain areas with that system that we typically know that we can't use the particle system anymore because we have to do something else. The most common example of this is with collisions. If you're ever doing a, a, a particle, say like a spark effect, that you need to maybe stop when it hits the wall or bounce against the wall or something like that, you can't use the inbuilt particle system for that because there's no way to get those particles to find a collision. This could be the solution, uh, which is the new operator. Uh, the new operator is kind of how we create these tiny little effects that are going to be performance friendly. So let's say that we have um, a, a function we're declaring uh, called spark. And we're going to say it has the arguments of sprite and the arguments of color. Okay, and then we'll open the brackets for it here. So... I know this is called a function, but GameMaker wants you to think of it as a class. So if you're familiar with JavaScript or any other language, this is kind of what GameMaker's new class system is like. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it yet. Um, we're going to say that our sprite index equals the thing we passed in for sprite. We're going to say that my color equals the thing we passed in for color. And then we're going to have some functions underneath it. We're going to say uh, move and collide. Uh, equals function and this is where we could do all of that stuff uh, for movement and collisions and then we could have another for drawing but we're not going to worry about that the new operator lets us actually uh, instantiate um, this function and it actually does say here as a lightweight object and it passes this information into it so I can say um, my spark equals new spark and then pass in SPR spark and pass in C red. And what I've done is it's almost like I've run instance create. Running new is like the instance create function and spark, our function, is like the object we're passing in. Um, this is just, it, it won't be in the whole game maker system because real instances, real objects, uh, you know, they have the physics, they have the sprite renderer on them, they go into all the collision systems, the archeries, they, they instance activation, deactivation, there's all these things that instances get shoved into that for a simple spark effect, we don't need that in there. So this is a way that we can create our own systems with this. And this opens up so many doors to the kind of things that you can come up with. Um, but it's, it's such confusing terminology because when people think lightweight object in game maker terms, what they're thinking of with these new additions is the new operator being used on a function. So YYG, if you are listening, I beg you, change the term object in game maker to actor. The things that we create with sprites and code are now actors. They go through our games let them be actors. Um, but yeah, that, that's the point. And this thing, it, it's a little confusing for sure. Um, you know, I've definitely seen people saying like, why aren't lightweight objects? Why are they better than DS maps? And, and that's fair. I'd say the notation is definitely better. Um, and I think it'd be really cool if we see the direction of GameMaker go in a way where people don't even use GameMaker objects anymore. They create everything as... Uh, they use the new operator uh, on these functions and, and lightweight objects 
and then they just have one object that's managing all of them. Uh, I, I really do wonder if we'll see that. And I think for smaller games or more simple games, uh, we'll see that a lot. And for bigger games, they'll be all over the place. Um, there's definitely questions remaining to be had. Uh, there, there's some confusing terminology here. Um, but at the end of the day, no matter which way these things go, um, you can kind of create your own uh, miniature instances, <laughs> let's call them. <laughs> Anyway, uh, that's what those two things are, um, and they're really exciting. I'm excited for us to see more. You know, there's a long time for us to learn more things and understand how these things work. The next section uh, is exception support. This is awesome. There's, like, nothing confusing about this. Um, Yellow Afterlife actually already made an extension that uses this, and in Forger we use it. Basically, exception support means that you can, like, detect when your game hits an error, and you can... <laughs> You can ignore it. This is hilarious to add the game maker simply just because of who its target audience usually is. Right. I can totally see people just try catching their entire game and ignoring all errors. That's not <laughs> what this is for. A try and a catch in programming is what you do when you're doing something that you expect could lead to an error. So we do this in, in Forager um, to when we're loading save files because normally an error in your game is pretty much something that you can avoid but there are circumstances where you can't they're, they're mm. like for example if a player like opened our save file and deleted half of it and you know it's, it's all like yeah. a, a ds grid right and then they try to load it the game will crash i can't fix that like there's nothing yeah, i sure, can do to yeah. fix that but what i can do is now using this new support uh i can write try and then in brackets i can do load game and i can you know, run that script. And then what will happen is that if there's an error that occurs in GameMaker while my code is in that try block, instead of just tossing up an error window, it'll see if I have a catch written after it and it will run whatever code I've put there. So maybe I just say, no, don't show an error. Uh, just show a message to the user saying your save file is corrupted and continue playing the game. Don't worry about the error. Uh, that might sound like crazy to some GameMaker mm -hmm. developers. <laughs> Because they might, you know, you might think of like an error as like, things just broke. That's not really what happens. It's just we're able to tell like something went wrong. Because any error that you get in Game Maker isn't the the game quote unquote breaking. It's something that YYG has put in place knowing that, oh, this might be an yeah, issue. Yeah. This try catch stuff is the same stuff that's mm -hmm. happening in the engine. When you uh, read a variable that doesn't exist. That's something that they try catch, and then they show you the error. If you ever actually hit a true issue in Game Maker that wasn't caught by them, the game would just close. Yeah, it would just literally instantly, which has happened occasionally. But those kind of engine bugs, as we call them, are exceedingly rare. So now you have the ability to try and catch bugs. So you can catch your player loading something incorrectly. You can do something that you might know might cause an error for something you can't control, and you can catch that and handle it. And another place that we use this, and unfortunately. I don't think, based on what we're reading here, that uh, Game Maker will have this, which means that Yellow Afterlife's extension is still really cool. It's called Catch Error, by the way. Just check it out. What we use Catch Error for on top of this uh, like save file checking um, is that his thing will constantly be checking to see if any errors happen. And if they do, he suppresses them and he puts them like in a data structure. Okay. And then anywhere in your code, you can check to see if that data structure has an error inside of it and then behave accordingly. What we do for that is it's essentially like my entire the entire game of Forager is in one big try catch. And if you hit an error, we have a custom error message that we display. It's very pretty. It has one of our, our cute characters on it in an animated sprite. Sure. And then you can you can hit a send report button and then it sends the information of your crash, everything you were doing, so much stuff to this whole big uh, service that we use, which is called Sentry, which is used by massive companies like Dropbox and real companies mm. for their error tracking in, in real time, which means, as a brief anecdote, when Forager launches, uh, I am I have like nightmares of my <laughs> phone suddenly exploding, but that's yeah. neither here nor there. Um, but that's an incredibly powerful tool to have as a professional developer because normally you have to just rely upon someone caring enough about this error to find you and send it to you and then even then you just have like an error message doesn't tell yeah, you much yeah. so adding in try catch introduces so much stability uh, and and bug fixing possibility for professional developers 
because I feel like there has actually been kind of a, a, a somewhat of a history, I guess, of um, game maker games coming out and having errors with them that are then notoriously quite difficult for their right. creators. So like Undertale, like as as um, right. Delta Rune as well, like suffered from a few things like that, where like an error shows up and it's something to do with the engine or something underneath, and you've no idea what's going on. <laughs> right, exactly, <laughs> exactly, and, and for for. And for the user, it's not a great experience mm. to just see that like weird code error. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this way, I can actually tell the user like, "Hey, one, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> two, <laughs> uh, two. This is what you can do next. And three, you can just click this button, and it's taken care of for you, and we'll patch it right away." Yeah, yeah. And then finally, we get to the uh, the garbage collector. I can't tell you anything about this because Yo Yo didn't tell you anything about this. <laughs> this has no information. I can tell you a little bit about what a garbage collector is in what other things. Mean? Like Unity is is just recently adding one in. And I, this is a complicated subject because this deals in like actual how memory works. So I'm not an expert. But basically like the idea is that like uh, if, if I had a something, let's just call it a data structure, but I don't think that's what yo-yo means. If I had a data structure in my game um, and... I had references it to it in three variables, then nothing happens. The game continues, that data structure is there. But say that I take all three of those variables and I set them to undefined or anything else really, um, the engine now knows that nothing in my code references that structure, which by default means that I'm done with it because I, I, I can't use it anymore. I've lost all references to it. Right. The idea is that it just deletes it right then and there. I don't have to worry about cleaning it up myself, like how we have cleanup events and we always run DSS destroy, DS map destroy, and, we, mm -hmm. and that's how we get memory leaks. The idea is that the engine is now able to look at everything we've created and know when we no longer need it and then get rid of it ourselves. Um, that sounds so fine. It does. Yeah, I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> I I mean, and I, I think that's just because we're conditioned yeah, in, in Game Maker maybe. to you know make sure we're covering our steps. And it's kind of weird to just trust this thing to catch our our stuff like, like most that best practice in game maker tends to be of not trusting anything game maker does by itself right, right? <laughs> and, and and the thing is like it says that it cleans up variables and instances those are the two things that they reference hmm. we already don't clean up those things i don't clean variables <laughs> and i certainly don't clear out an instance's memory <laughs> yeah like <laughs> i have some bigger questions now but the thing, the only thing that right now it would really make sense to me is if they're talking about like data structures and runtime sprites and surfaces and stuff like that, but they don't mention that. Mm. And maybe this is specifically related to this new stuff they're adding, which doesn't really make it make a whole lot more sense to me. Uh, but all they really say is the collector is very fast because it's running on a different thread, which, okay, we'll see. Uh, point is, I have no idea. It, it, it's completely up in the air what this thing will do uh we'll just have to wait to see more um but that about covers every change that they have introduced obviously there's a lot of really exciting stuff stuff that we see in other languages um all of this stuff is very comparable to javascript we see game maker moving uh, in a direction of becoming more and more like javascript mm. um we still have a lot of questions there's there's still some contradictions in this post that i'm sure could be answered with a, a quick thing and in fact there's an ama going on right now i, sh I should just be asking these questions yeah. <laughs> um but specifically with like the differences between a lightweight object and then like a function being used as a class with a new operator i want to hear more on but at the end of the day we're not going to see this stuff until the end of the year there's a lot of time for more stuff to be clarified and we don't need to know how to use it yet um the point is there is a lot of really exciting stuff that people uh should be super pumped about and you know game maker just got a lot more high level yeah so and i mentioned i mentioned earlier in this sorry you go ahead first i've been talking for ways <laughs> sorry so i was just gonna say the bottom line of this kind of seems to be like there's a lot more ways to do things in game maker now yes with this stuff. And yes a lot more like there's because i think that's as i was kind of saying before that the time we, we get this question all the time of, oh can i do x in game maker can i make a whatever yes. in game maker and the answer is always yes and there's always yes. that kind of tiny elephant in the room of but you know um exactly there's always been a way to do everything involved in making a video game in game maker but it just depends how many hoops you're prepared to jump through um this i guess gives you a lot more 
a lot more ways to jump through more of those hoops at once, I guess, <laughs> in a way. Right, right. Um, it gives some of the more standard practice, the ways you'd expect to do these things. Someone yeah. just yesterday asked in the Game Maker Discord, which is a question we get like every day, can you build an MMO RPG in Game Maker? Yeah. And I'm just so used to this question at this point. I responded, yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And they're like, really? But, and they're like, really? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, but you're asking the wrong question. Ask me how difficult it is. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, okay, how hard is it? I'm like, almost to the point where you shouldn't bother trying. Yeah. And now the answer today with all this stuff, uh, well, for an MMO, it's the same answer. But <laughs> the, point, the point is, is, is that it just got a little more definitely, viable. It makes yeah, it makes Game Maker a lot more comfortable and natural to work in. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be fighting the engine as much. This is stuff that the professional community, the higher end community, have asked for such a long time. Um, and it's also just exciting in a general perspective because Game Maker is how so many people learn the program, yeah. and this will make it like if. You know, if if you are fluent in 2020 GML, learning JavaScript will take no effort for you, which is such an exciting thing to be able to do now. Because now GML, like right now, is just weird and it has some weird things it teaches mm -hmm. you that are just not how things work. Um, but yeah, the the bar has been raised. And and one thing that I said I'd talk about earlier is like, you know, there's there's a spectrum of where people's programming preferences lie in terms of. Uh, they want to just get the game done, or they want to do it beautifully, in terms of their code. Yeah, sure. You know, I think on the far on the far left of that side, you have like the JWs of programming, and I say that out of love. I think like <laughs> you know, from, from what I don't, <clears throat> I don't know JW, but from like, what I've heard, like he just focuses on getting the game done. It doesn't matter how good your code works or if it's hacky. Like no considerations there. Just get the game done, which I think is smart. First of all, and also. It caters to exactly how Game Maker works. Mm -hmm. Game Maker wants you to be quick and dirty. That's how its style yeah. works. And with this stuff, it's it's a little bit better. You, you don't have to be dirty. But still, at the end of the day, Game Maker's shining uh, trait is how fast it is. It's so fast to get a game going. It's so fast to port a game. Yeah. That is what Game Maker is. And, and stuff like Unity is for building massive, complicated, uh, beautiful, but long-term investment type projects that take much longer to build. And they have huge advantages, um, and in my opinion, and it just depends on who you are as a programmer, I find that kind of programming much more fun. Uh, but if we, if we look at those as the two sides of the fence, the far left where it's just you, you're really easy and the far right where you want to make it beautiful, I think Game Maker's percentage of that territory owned just went a little bit more to the right. Sure. I think it's pushing back a little bit more now. Um, you know, if, if you a lot of people find themselves in the middle of that spectrum where... They just want to get the game done. You know, they are focused on actually the product and getting the job done, but they know that some other things will make their lives easier as programmers and make it more fun and make it more doable, and make it less of a headache and be more stable. I think those people in the middle just kind of got some validation mm -hmm. for using Game Maker. Or like, you don't have to, I don't want to say feel bad. You should never feel bad for the engine you're using. <laughs> if you feel bad that you're using Game Maker, that's a whole separate conversation. But you should feel more confident sure. in it now. You, you have these these things available to you that give you less of a reason to need to switch out. Um, for professionals and large scale projects, especially, this is this is really good news. This adds a lot of longevity to Game Maker's lifespan for a developer. Uh, just just to throw on at the end there, I suppose about what you were saying, considering this is kind mm -hmm. of a spectrum of, <laughs> I guess. Uh, Another example, even further left, of sort of the JW program, which is kind of mm -hmm. where I kind of sit on that spectrum a lot as well, <laughs> is that you could say drag and drop, for example, is even further left. Oh, right, yeah, in yeah. Because in very similar way, you can do basically anything with it as long as you're prepared mm -hmm. to create a yeah i mean you totally can not you could create of... you could create an mmo rpg using drag and drop mm -hmm. and that is a fact yeah that i will defend you for you're just not you just shouldn't <laughs> just basically, you shouldn't yeah. <laughs> you're just you're, you're making a silly silly mistake um but yeah that this is this is great i'm really excited to see what people do with this awesome well thank you very much for stopping by and helping yeah. clarify more of these uh, more complex. As I say, we're not. It's difficult because we can't describe these things in a way of saying, right. "Oh, yeah, now this is just speculation." Can... Yeah, mm -hmm. we can't say, "Oh, now you can do this thing." Um, it, you can create this element of a game, for example, in something very clear, very uh, that new people would understand. Because all that stuff, as we've just been saying, is has always been possible and always been possible to do. And it's all just about right. 
uh, being able to do this in ways that are sustainable long term and uh, and uh, will uh, are more geared to creating uh, a professional product, I suppose. Um, right. Yeah. I mean, this is all tricky. Uh, you know, we don't know everything yet. I'm speculating yeah, more this, than this, anything this right now. So I'm just saying, like, yeah. this is how some other game engines do stuff, and that's what it looks like. This stuff is going to be. Yeah. Um, and so but, obviously yeah. all of this is subject to change. We don't know anything about this. We don't. Uh, oh, we yeah, don't... don't show up on my Twitter feed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you said it in this video. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, this is why I got you here, so everyone can blame you. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm the, yeah, I'm the scapegoat. And we don't know when it'll show up. Show up. I mean, yeah, they said Q4 2019, but let's be fair. They say a lot I'll of things. I'll see you all in 2025, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, I hope you all enjoyed that. I hope you all got something out of this. And uh, I'll catch you all next time. Thanks, uh, Lazy Eye, for stopping by. Bye bye. Yeah, yeah. Hello, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that. It was quite a long video, but I hope it was pretty worthwhile. I think we covered a lot of interesting stuff there, a lot of cool new things coming to Game Maker. Future looks pretty bright. I want to take a moment to thank all of my Patreon supporters as per usual. And I want to thank, in particular, but in no particular order, the following Bowser the Dog, Bertie T, Dakadondigo, Danger King 11. Do What Doobie, Eric Matthew Hibbs, Gabe, James L. Anderson, James Siggins, Jason, Jason McMillan, Kimo Savalampi, Lodowick Tossaint, Martin Barasevic, Max M, Michael Ward, Owen Morgan, Rahul Asuri, Relentless Rex, Robert Churches, Rovan Darlin, Rudy Romero, Ren, Rune Jorgensen, Stephen Hagen, Tiago C. Martinelli, Tia Lesson, Timothy Hamilton, and Zinan May. Thank you all so much for enabling me to do what I do. I'll catch you all next time.